Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, this this uh, webinar. It's the third webinar in a series of uh, three uh, that we organized this month in which we shine the light of behavioral design to some fascinating uh, topics, fascinating problems. Last week, uh, some of you might have attended it, uh, we did a webinar on, um, on sales and how to become better at selling through the lens of uh, behavioral design. Yesterday, we had an, inno an, an innovation webinar in which we explored how uh, psychology could be treated as a, uh, as a very, I would say, untapped and valuable source of innovation. Um, and today we have our third and, and final uh, session in webinar month, which is all about, you know, looking at the, uh, the, the challenge and the fascinating problem of team behavior and how we can use behavioral design thinking and behavioral science to, you know, to shape uh, team behavior in a positive way. So let me introduce myself briefly. My name is Tom De Bruyne. I am one of the co-founders of uh, Sue. Um, we're an Amsterdam-based behavioral design company. Basically, Sue is a, um, a team of uh, behavioral design experts. Um, we do uh, both uh, training, capacity development, as well as uh, a consultancy project. Um, and we use the behavioral design method to help our clients to improve their, their marketing, their offers, their product, their services, um, uh, in order to, um, uh, you know, to, 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 to shape customer behavior. We work for governments to work on uh, citizen behavior. Uh, we work on, for NGOs on, uh, on giving behavior. And more and more, we work for companies to figure out how to, uh, to shape employee behavior. So, um, and, and of course, you can, you can always uh, find everything about, about Sue on the, um, on the uh, suebehavioraldesign.com website. Uh, never uh, never um, um, hesitate to subscribe to the newsletter. I can highly recommend it. Um, we have a weekly newsletter on, on basically everything uh, that is happening in the world and that has to do with influence. Uh, we use our newsletter to, to try to shine a, 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 a behavioral design perspective on, uh, on that reality. Um, we also have a very good blog, I must say. Um, we, uh, we don't post regularly, but we have a great archive uh, built over the years of uh, some very, I think, inspiring content on uh, behavioral design thinking. Um, so what, what is behavioral design? Really, really, very short. I would say behavioral design, the best summary is the combination of design thinking as a process uh, to turn uh, uh, insight into ideas, ideas into prototypes and prototypes into, I would say, learn learning. Um, to, to combine the process of design thinking with the signs of influence. So if you use the signs of influence as a rocket, as a rocket engine uh, into your design thinking process, then you first get much better insights because you have a much deeper understanding of why people do the things they do and why they don't do the things we want them to do. You get much better ideas in your ideation process because you can use uh, principles from the signs of influence to, you know, to come up with ideas and you get much better uh, insights in your prototype testing uh, and your experiments because, again, you have much more um, scientific, a scientific framework to, uh, to have a better understanding why some prototypes really work and, so, and why some, uh, some prototypes absolutely uh, flatline in your, uh, in your experiments. Um, so it's a very fun and fascinating uh, process and, and it puts the, a deep love of the psychology of the user, a deep uh, love of the problem of the user at the core of the, um, of the design and innovation process. So today we're going to shed the light on, a, on one of my favorite topics and um, it's the topic of team behavior. And um, I think every one of you um, uh, has, I think, well, some of you uh, have definitely had the privilege of working in a great team. And some of you might already have the dreadful experience of having worked in a terrible team. And you can all kind of sense 
um, what it means to be part of a great team or what it means to be part of a team that, that sucks big time. And I think it all has to do with, um, with the culture. And, um, uh, you, you know, uh, company cultures and team cultures is a very, very abstract concept. But if you think about it, a culture actually is nothing more than the sum of behaviors. A culture is not something that just is out there. A culture is something that arises, arises from the behavior that people perform in a, in a group or in a company or in a team. And you can actually that there's there's some there's some uh, uh, th th there's a lot of definitions. I, th I think there's thousands of definitions of what defines a company culture. I think one of the most fun and pragmatic definitions that I came across is that a culture is um, the behaviors that people perform when nobody is looking, when nobody is watching. I think that's a, that's quite a a, a good one. Um, and I think it's absolutely true. Um, when we uh, think of a culture of a company, the culture is, is uh, heavily influenced by the kind of behaviors that people perform when nobody is looking. Or vice versa, the culture of a company is highly determined by the behaviors that are being rewarded or the behaviors that are not being punished. I mean, the antisocial and the uh, unproductive behaviors if they don't get punished, then we have we quickly learn that apparently this culture is highly tolerant or this company is highly tolerant for um, uh, for unproductive, unconstructive uh, behaviors. So I think this is a much more pragmatic definition of uh, what we you know what makes a company exceptional. It's uh, a company that is exceptional and, and uh, exceptional and successful is a company that promotes and um, and suppresses certain behaviors, and that the be that when those behaviors turn into habits, then these habits are exactly what determines a culture. So, as a behavioral uh, designer, as a behavioral scientist, I'm deeply interested in. What are these behaviors? And what are the behaviors that successful teams and successful companies perform? Um, um, so in this, in this webinar, um, I, I want to explore these behaviors. And I think it's definitely interesting to start with, you know, the behaviors of uh, deeply problematic companies, because we can learn a lot by what are the behaviors that, that it, once teams and once companies perform these behaviors, um, uh, uh, th that they actually lead to dramatic outcomes. And I think um, uh, to make this point, I, I, I want to explore this idea that most problems in organizations really can be attributed to a bad understanding of human decision making. So those of you who were in my uh, webinar yesterday know that there's basically always, well, that behavioral designers always um, take one step back. We always want to, uh, look first at um, uh, how does decision making work and do we have a good understanding of how our brain actually makes decisions because if you understand how humans make decisions uh, then you can quickly realize why some interventions to influence that behavior completely don't match with how our brain actually makes decisions and definitely in the world of organizations in the world of companies in the world of teams um, there's there's a lot of bad understanding of how our brain actually works and this bad understanding leads to very very dramatic outcome and i would say that the that the number one um the number one um, mistake that most companies make when it comes to designing, uh, when it comes to shaping team behavior, is that most companies think of people as rational humans. And so they set up all kinds of rational management systems um, in order to get the most efficiency out of these, uh, these hyper-rational humans. So if you pay them more money, if you manage them more carefully, et cetera, et cetera, you will get better outcomes. And as a behavioral scientists, we know that this is a recipe for disaster because we're not dealing with humans. We're dealing with uh, we're not dealing with um, uh, rational people. We're dealing with different people. And Daniel Kahneman, the godfather of behavioral science, has a beautiful, I would say, metaphor for it. He says there's two kinds of people. Well, <laughs> there's another scientist who once said there's two kinds of people: those who divide the world in two kinds of people and those who don't. That's another one. I think that was, ah, oh shit, I forgot his name. Ken, Ken Robinson. 
Um, he has a, a brilliant TED talk on education. But da Kahneman has another, I would say, division. He said there's two kinds of people. There's Econs and there's humans. Now, Econs are uh, people that only exist in uh, classic economic theory and in uh, manuals on marketing. Uh, these are the people that are smart, rational. They make decisions out of self-interest. They make cost-benefit analysis. They uh, are very economic. They always go for the highest value for the lowest amount of, of money. And they think things through. Well, Kahneman says, uh, these people exist in the heads of managers and in the heads of classic economic theorists uh, and macroeconomists, but they don't exist in reality. What exists in reality are, are what he calls humans. And humans are incredibly biased, incredibly impulsive. They are very irrational in their decision-making. We are highly social animals. Our desire to be loved and our desire to be respected is much stronger than our desire to you know, make the, uh, the most rational and most utilitarian decision. We are incredibly impulsive. We, we much rather make decisions impulsively uh, without having to think hard about it because think, thinking hard uh, usually provides us with a lot of stress. And we make decisions based on shortcuts, something that we explored yesterday extensively. So if you design an organization with econs in mind, what you do is um, you build up uh, management systems, whether you do it intentionally or out of stupidity, uh, but you design management system in which you kind of think that there's a direct link between rewards and output. The more excessive the bonus, the harder people will run. Very stupid idea, doesn't work at all in reality. We're going to explore that in a little bit. Um, when you design a company for econ, that basically what you think about management, your definition of management is nothing more than, you know, than, than optimizing the machine for efficiency. Um, when you're um, uh, designing for econs, then you only think in hierarchy because the, the more hierarchy you introduce in the company, uh, the better it will scale. Uh, and, and of course, you only that there's, there's so much management literature bullshit on this one. You, ha you have to find the A-listers. And if you pay them well, uh, uh, magic will follow. First of all, what is an A-lister? And second of all, an A-lister is an A-lister in, in a specific context and can be, a, uh, can be a C person in a different context. It really all depends on the context and, and the context determines whether someone will thrive or not. If you design, on the other hand, a, a processes and a company with humans in mind, then you take the, the, the human, the deep need for recognition, belonging, competition as your point of departure. Um, you, you, you realize that people are full of status anxiety and that they're always in power struggles. We're, we're um, much more uh, driven by a fear of losing social status than our desire to maximize our social status. We are much more terrified of making mistakes than we have the desire to, you know, to, to make uh, gambles uh, for the best possible outcome. Because we perfectly know that if our gamble doesn't play, pay out, that there are a lot of people who, will, um, who are very, very keen on, uh, you know, on, 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 on taking our uh, social position on the social ladder. In, in a lot of organization, people are obsessed with their social status. And I would say that's not their fault. They are a part of an organization that really triggers that obsession. Because if management is constantly signaling that you can't make mistake and that the best way for you to be popular in the eyes of the manager is to do exactly what the manager does, then you basically design a system in, peach, in which people become obsessed with social status. Um, so um, uh, forget these last one. I, I, I quickly want to go to some spectacular screw ups, if you will. So I, some of you who are old enough probably remember Enron. Uh, Enron was like the, the big, uh, gigantic um, uh, bankruptcy before the 2008 financial crisis. Um, and the story of Enron was that it was the most successful company in America. It uh, was a energy company in the Midwest, but year after year, they became the poster child of, um, uh, of you know, uh, uh, capitalism. And, and the, the, the CEO was constantly on the cover of Forbes magazine. as like, th this was the company who was so successful in scaling and growing and disrupting industries that, that everyone was constantly uh, um, trying to figure out what is the success recipe for Enron. And 
one of the uh, top executives, Jeffrey Skilling, um, I think he was the CEO or the CFO, um, he, uh, the, he created this management system called Rank and Yank. And it was highly praised and everyone was trying to copy it. And what was the idea behind uh, Rank and Yank? Well, that um, um, basically Enron said, we as a very, very progressive company, um, we measure everything. And our whole idea uh, uh, on, on talent management this is that every quarter we, um, we fire the top 50, well, sorry, we fire the bottom 15% performers and we give a big raise to the top 15% performers. Very econ idea of running a company. You, it's like if you fire the weakest links and you reward the highest links, then, then by some invisible hand, everyone will become better. That's when you think when your company consists of rational people. But of course, if you're dealing with humans, the first thing people think of, oh, is this, if this is the game, let's play the game. So everyone who was afraid of becoming, uh, uh, the, uh, of ending up in the bottom 15% performers were cooking the numbers because they wanted to avoid to become uh, a, a bottom 15 uh, person who would get yanked. Um, uh, and the top 50 people who, were think that, who thought they were doing quite well, they wanted to be part of the top 15 performers. So they were also cooking the numbers because you want to be part of that. Well, after a couple of years, um, the story is, is that, that Enron went bankrupt because the numbers were so cooked that they turned out to have hidden debt of about $2 billion uh, uh, that, suddenly, um, that suddenly came to the surface and the company went bankrupt. And it's a beautiful story of some sociopathic management who think that, that you need to motivate people through this highly, you know, econ kind of reward system. Um, and the, the financial crisis in 2008 is exactly the same story. Um, um, and there's a Dutch anthropologist called Joris uh, uh, Luyendijk, who, um, a journalist, anthropologist, who had a brilliant idea. He said, I'm going to uh, move to London and work for The Guardian and I'm going to in uh, interview these bankers. And his hypothesis was these investment bankers who brought the world economy to the brink of collapse, they must be evil people. Um, um, and he did his interviews and turned out that uh, he was quite surprised that, that actually he didn't encounter that much sociopaths. Um, time and again, when he interviewed those bankers, they, uh, they were actually people with, uh, in their private life with uh, nice people, high ethical standards. Um, but time and again, they told him that they, first of all, were very, very proud of the fact that they were allowed to play in like the Champions League of banking. Investment, being investment banker in London is like the Champions League. There's, there's a lot of social status involved if you are allowed to play in that, um, in that league. And then second uh, thing is, is that they said, well, the system is designed in such a way that if I make good money on the stock exchange, I will get an excessive bonus. But if I fail with my investment, then I don't get any punishment because uh, it's, it's not my money, it's my client's money. And if the client's money, like pension funds, etc., can't pay the bill anymore, then society will pick up the bill. So basically, the whole system is designed to promote excessive gambling behavior. And that's precisely what these people did. We can think of their behavior as irrational, but it was, it was perfectly predictable, irrational behavior. And there's actually an economist called Joe Stiglitz, a famous economist, who already said it's not going to be a matter of when the economy will collapse, when the financial system will collapse, uh, if the financial system will collapse, it will be a matter of when. Because he perfectly understood that if you design a system that really triggers ga excessive gambling, gambling behavior, the system eventually will collapse. It, even worse, they they actually inflated stock prices because they perfectly knew that if you inflate the stock price, you will get more bonus. Luckily, they kind of um, uh, now um, um, intervened in that bonus systems, but, but it's still, still very, very fragile. Um, and I, I know that a lot of companies are obsessed with, with, uh, with bonuses, with financial rewards, with financial ex ex uh, incentives. And um, again, I would say that bonuses are a bad idea. Um, they're a good idea on group level, on team level. They're a bad idea on, in on individual level. 
maybe with one acceptance, and that is salespeople. Salespeople, when they work individually, uh, are highly competitive, highly uh, uh, outcome and, and achievement driven. Uh, salespeople are, are highly uh, incentivized through a financial reward. But in all other uh, contexts, context, I wouldn't do it, except maybe for a, a bonus related to like a group outcome or a team outcome. And there's a couple of fascinating psychological reasons why an in individual incentive is a bad idea. Um, so first of all, Dan Ariely did some great research on that, as, and, and he discovered that there's a negative correlation between the size and the bonus and the quality of the work. In other words, the higher the incentive, the higher the bonus, the more you will do very stupid things in order to achieve that bonus. Because your number one driver for your behavior will be that bonus and not the uh, successful outcome of the company. So the higher the bonus, the higher the stupidity of behaviors that people will do to achieve that bonus. Second one is, is that the moment you in, in introduce a bonus for behavior, for work that's highly intrinsic motivating, you will kill the intrinsic motivation. In other words, we are deeply motivated by the content of our work, by uh, the outcome of, of, of the work, by collaborating with each other. That provides us with a lot of psychological satisfaction. But the moment you replace that psychological satisfaction, that intrinsic motivation with in extrinsic reward, then the behavior loses all its psychological rewarding value because you suddenly kind of only do it because of the reward. And it sucks all of the, all the joy out of your work. Because if you don't get the reward, you will be very, very frustrated. Um, third component is the what I call the Ronaldo problem. Um, um, Ronaldo, as some of you know, um, and, as, and we can argue about that, but Ronaldo is the second best footballer in the world. There's a big debate on that. I would put him on the second best uh, spot in the world next to Messi. Um, the problem with Ronaldo was that he, by now the, the man uh, probably already made more than a billion uh, euros in his career. Um, but he left Real Madrid because he was deeply frustrated with the fact that Messi in my view, the number one best player of all times, Messi made more money than he did. And he couldn't bear the idea that Messi was making 250 million euros a year and he was only making uh, 170 euro million euros. In other words, the amount of the bonus completely didn't matter. It didn't matter at all because the only thing that people look at is, do I make more than the guy I compare myself with? And that's, of course, the problem with, um, with executive bonuses is that they get higher and higher because these ego testicle maniacs of executives uh, don't, it, it, the size of the bonus doesn't, don't matter. They just want to have a higher bonus than, than the guys they encounter at the golf club or at the hockey club because that's all, the only thing that matters. It's social status that, that comes from it. And then a last reason why bonus are problematic is, is a, a, a phenomenon called Goodhart's law. And Goodhart is a social scientist and he came up with this formula. He said basically that every metric that becomes a KPI, that becomes a target, loses its value as a metric for measurement. I can best illustrate this with the Cobra problem. The Cobra problem was a problem in, I think, uh, it was in, in Mumbai. And in the city of Mumbai had a problem with a Cobra plague. And um, uh, so the city came up with a brilliant idea. We're going to reward people to bring in dead cobras. With every cobra they bring in, we're going to incentivize them. Well, what they just did was that uh, people, well, that's, that's a good econ ID, but humans thought, hey, there's a business model there. So quickly, cobra farms started to pop up in which they were, you know, um, breeding cobras in order to get a reward. It was a highly rewarding business model. And then the city thought, oh, my God, this, this incentive was such a bad idea. Let's stop the incentive because um, um, we're making the problem worse. What did the cobra farmers do? They released the cobras on the street because there was no business model anymore. So the, in the end result was that the cobra plague was even higher than in the beginning of the, um, of the reward system. So this is what happens when, um, uh, when you design behavior in a very bad way. So what happens when you do it uh, in a good way? What, what, can the psychology of, um, what can the psychology of team behavior uh, and the psychology of influence teach us about 
um, you know, uh, 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 great team behavior, of high performance team behavior. Well, um, um, those of you again who were in my session yesterday know that we, um, uh, behavioral designers are obsessed with outside in thinking. Um, and uh, the, I, I would say this is the number one mindset of behavioral design. Um, so what is inside out thinking is, is thinking we have something uh, incredible, whether it's our company, our processes, or our product. And thinking inside out means how can we make this customer or employee fall in love with our company or fall in love with our method. And the problem of the employee or the customer, if you think customer centric, is that they haven't figured out yet how awesome we are. They're, they're a little bit uninformed or a little bit stupid. That's really inside out thinking. Outside in thinking is exactly the opposite. So when you think outside in, you kind of think, what are the deeper needs that people have in their life that they want to see fulfilled through whether it would be a product or whether it would be work? And once you start asking that question, then the question becomes very fascinating. So when you start thinking, when you start asking yourself the question, what are the deeper needs that people want to see fulfilled through work? Um, you, you can quickly start to realize why some teams and companies thrive and why some companies um, are toxic, why some companies suck. So um, th th we, we, we always use this concept of the job to be done. People have jobs to be done in their life and those jobs to be done can be very functional. I want to make money. But, but, but the deeper jobs to be done in their life are much more emotional. And so we did a big study on that. And at the last slide, I'm, I'm going to share the link that it's on the website. But we learned in our, um, in, our, in our study that people have very deep psychological needs that they need to see fulfilled through work. The number one is recognition. I want to feel recognized. I want to be appreciated. I want to belong to a team. I want to uh, uh, grow and learn uh, in, in my job. I want to get into flow. Um, I want challenge and adventure. I want, just like in a game, I want to work on, on puzzles that are fun to crack, uh, that are fun to, you know, to, to, to solve uh, uh, together with my colleague. I want to contribute to something bigger. I want to have the feeling that there's meaning in my work. These are all very, very important jobs to be done. Um, um, and what happens in teams that, uh, uh, that provide, you know, uh, let me put it differently. The number one criterion for high performance teams is that they provide, that they carefully cater to these needs. When people feel that their need for recognition, appreciation and belonging and flow and challenge are being met, then they, have, um, then they are incredibly happy, incredibly productive and they become incredibly creative. Well, it turns out that high performance teams do a really good job that what differentiates high performance teams, I'm first going to show this slide, do a really good job at catering in this need. So uh, Google did a very big study a couple of years ago called Project Aristotle. Um, and as you know, the, the, there's a good advantage, to, there's also a disadvantage to the fact that Google measures everything. The great thing that Google measures everything is that they are a very data-driven uh, company. They, um, they are very much keen on high-quality decision-making through data. And so they wanted to figure out what are the defining characteristics of high-performance teams. Because if you can crack that code, you can then know what you need to do in order to um, um, you know, build and scale your company. If you crack the code of high-performance team behavior, then you can really build and scale uh, your company to the next level. So what did Google discover? They tried everything. Should we put friends in a, in a team or uh, a good balance of male and female or senior and non-senior or a diverse mix of profiles? Well, it turns out that all of these variables didn't do anything. There were only two variables that matter, and these two variables were uh, highly behavioral. So they discovered that in a high-performance team, first of all, um, um, in a high performance team, everyone had equal speaking time. And second uh, behavior was, uh, was psychological safety. Everyone was sensitive to each other's emotion in a high performance team. If you don't feel well, or if you, 
uh, uh, if you have an emotional trouble or if you feel offended, then a high performance team is highly sensitive to that. And these two simple behavior turn out to be the, the highest, have the highest predictive value on what differentiate a high performance team behavior. And this matches completely with what we just discovered in our influence framework, because the number one driver for people that they want to see fulfilled through work is appreciation, recognition, and belonging. And so they also did a very fun experiment um, when you connect that insight with uh, how you reward people. And they came up with a brilliant bonus system. So instead of uh, a rewarding behavior uh, based on, uh, for instance, targets, uh, so the purely financial incentive systems, they started to introduce a completely different set of um, uh, rewards uh, called um, uh, experiential bonuses. And so what are experiential bonuses? Well, they, they gave managers basically a, um, a, a quite, a, a, quite a, a good amount of money uh, to reward their employees on, in unexpected ways. So whenever someone was working overtime, uh, was working hard to, uh, to, to for instance, to meet, a, to meet a deadline, a manager could go to that person and could say, hey, I know what you did this week. You couldn't be with your family because you spent some all-nighters and we really, really appreciate that. So in order, as a token of our appreciation, here's the credit card. Take your family out this weekend to the best restaurant in town or go to Disneyland, whatever. It's on us. Just here's the credit card. No questions asked. Um, uh, go for it. Well, it turns out that from a psychological perspective, it was massively more important, massively more impactful because people felt the appreciation. They felt that uh, their management understood what they were doing, understood that they were going the extra mile. And even three years after the experiential bonus, they still uh, remembered that and they still appreciated the fact that their management saw what they were doing. And so it doesn't cost you that much. It, it costs you a, a dinner or a trip um, uh, to, to Disneyland. But the psychological impact of the signal of appreciation is incredibly large. Um, I would definitely suggest to, to work with that. So um, quickly, no, we're still on schedule. That's good. So third principle is that, uh, so we, we already discovered that um, um, bad organizations have a very bad understanding of what drive people's behavior, a very rational uh, point of departure instead of a psychological human point of departure. Second thing we um, uh, discovered is that uh, what sets apart a high performance team from a, uh, their counterparts is that high performance team really cater to the deeper psychological needs of their employees. And whether you work uh, as distributed teams or in companies, understanding these needs and trying to cater to them really uh, makes, makes the whole world of difference. So the third uh, uh, component of high performance team is, um, is team behavior, uh, team habits. Uh, great and high performance teams have habits to help them to stay focused, to help them to, uh, to find and to stay focused. And um, one of the key ideas of, of behavioral design uh, is that ability eats motivation for breakfast. And what does this mean? It means that if you want to change behavior or natural uh, inclination or natural tendency is to uh, try to reward that behavior, try to work on motivation, we need to motivate people to do what we want them to do. Well, it turns out that this is a suboptimal strategy to, uh, to change behavior. Ability is a far stronger strategy. And what are ability interventions? Ability is all about asking the question, can I make the desired behavior automatic? Can I trigger the desired behavior? Can I somehow, um, uh, yeah, can I somehow make that, un that desired behavior automatic or can I make the undesired behavior impossible? That's what you do when you think about these kind of interventions. Now, team habits are, um, are great at, um, at, at triggering the kind of behaviors that you want. So, um, uh, and the problem of course is, is that um, uh, when you try to rely on discipline and motivation to change team behavior, well, the problem is that we're just too distracted. We're tired. We have too many things on our mind. We're exhausted. Um, um, uh, we, we keep forgetting the things we should be thinking about. Only super athletes thrive on discipline. So 
uh, uh, when you want to change organizations or change behavior in an organization and you rely on explaining what you want them to do, it's a recipe for disaster. Even if people are highly motivated to do it, they just can't, you know, they just can't keep up to it because we're too distracted. We forget it. You read the manifesto and one day later, no, actually one hour later, you already forgot it. So what we need to do is we need to make desired behavior easy. If we want to, for instance, in a different domain, if you want people to eat healthier, well, make it easy for them to cook healthier. Already bring the ingredients together so that they don't need to think uh, anymore about how to cook a good, a good meal. Give me the ingredients, give me the recipe, and I will make the great meal. This is Mirta. Um, she was our personal trainer for, uh, for six months when my wife and I were getting married. We, uh, we knew that we needed to be a little bit more in shape. We, uh, we absolutely knew that, that it was impossible for us to go to the gym. We had a two-year-old and she kept us awake all night. So we designed an intervention, a behavioral design intervention. We created a forcing function in which we couldn't escape from our desired behavior. And so three times a week at eight o'clock in the morning, she would uh, stand on her doorstep and we will hate her for every minute that she was there. We were kicking and screaming five minutes to eight to get out of bed because we knew that this fucking lady would be there and, um, and torturing us. But every time that we went through the process, we were very grateful that we designed that intervention in which we couldn't escape. The fact that she's a very nice person also kind of helped. But every time, every morning, it was a dreadful thing for us to, to stick to the habit. But once you get into it and once you get through the valley of pain uh, and once it becomes a habit, it's, it becomes less and less torturing. So the key to great behavioral change in organization is to think of uh, ways to make um, um, you know, behavior automatic. So what can we do with this? Well, a simple intervention is, for instance, change the default. We uh, have this uh, somehow Microsoft or, or, or Apple, for that matter, uh, kind of, and uh, we're all addicted to this idea that meetings should last for one hour. That's a stupid idea. Why don't we um, uh, make the default that meetings can only last for 45 minutes or even half an hour? Um, if you do that, it will, you will see that people will actually do exactly the same amount of money, but uh, amount of work, but then in, in half an hour or 45 minutes. And you will have 45 minutes to do the email that you otherwise would already be following up in the meeting because you're too bored and too distracted to stick to the meeting. Um, so if teams agree with each other, let's, let's create a new default option and only do 40 or 45 minutes uh, 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 meetings. And let's promise each other that if we stick to these 45 minutes, that we won't look at our smartphone during the meeting, then you will already get a great amount of uh, uh, productivity boost. Um, I would also say teams need to schedule to, to make uh, an agreement on when to schedule meetings. Because if meetings are scattered all over the day, you will end up doing meetings for the rest of the day. While if a team says that, look, we are very productive in the morning, let's not schedule our meetings in the morning, but we are less productive in the afternoon, let's schedule all our meetings right after lunch. And then uh, that would give me a little bit more time at the end of the day to again do deep work. Um, that would already be a, a great forcing function, a great default option. And a very, very uh, good intervention are Pomodoros. Um, I, I, when I want to get into deep work, uh, doing uh, 25 minutes focused work sprints and then rewarding myself with five minutes of looking at my smartphone and drinking coffee, then I will be much, much more productive than if I would constantly uh, combine work, multitask. If you multitask and you get distracted by this, your ability to get into deep work completely drops with your IQ, IQ drops with 30 to uh, 20 to 30 percent. Whereas, as if you, whereas if you work in sprints of 25 to 30 minutes, then reward yourself, then sprint again, very focused in again, uh, 25 and 30 minutes. Well, after three or four sprints, in my experience, you will have done much more high quality work than you would otherwise do in two days. Uh, and that would be in two hours. Um, notifications are absolute Satan. You need to disable your notifications on your smartphone. I did this a couple of years ago. This is the best intervention on a small scale that you can do because these notifications are designed to distract you. And once you are distracted and you need to do deep work, all the puzzle pieces in your head that needs to, you know, percolate, that needs to 
makes make comb- a great creative idea is nothing more than puzzle pieces in your head that suddenly click that suddenly connect there's this great saying that great creativity is ideas having sex well these ideas can't have sex in your head when you're constantly distracted it needs some time for different puzzle pieces to make connections and so i would say notifications are satan and if you keep using notification a cute little kitten will die a horrible death every time you do that so d- don't do this if for the sake of the kitten um i'm yes um so email is the worst um uh email is a, is a system that is it is yeah it's it's this uh, what what Cal Newport who wrote a great book on this calls a hyperactive bee mind a beehive the problem is the more emails you get the more emails you will send the more emails you send the more emails you will get and you will end up doing nothing more than sending emails so a great way to uh, get rid of emails is to completely change the paradigm so for instance we have started working with trello and i'm very very excited with it why because trello is the opposite of email it's a, it's a board it's a place where the team constantly go back to so we have a management team trello we have a project team trello we have a, a sales and marketing trello and so whenever i'm working for instance in my management team role i go to the trello and i see what kind of tasks and what kind of um um uh, problems uh, i need to work on and then once a week we come together to this trello and and discuss new problems or new challenges or new tasks and by doing that i can perfectly decide on everyone in the team can perfectly decide when to work on their particular role every uh, entrepreneur that i know that have switched from uh, radically uh, dissing email only for the uh, for the for the very very utmost necessary and switch to systems like trello uh, have become uh, have become much more productive much more creative so um a very important one if you're the only if you're the only one in the team who tries to build habits then it won't work if you want to stick to pomodoro but everyone keeps interrupting you in these uh, in these uh, uh, typical garden like office spaces then it won't work i have seen great teams who have a um, a little lamp on their desk and whenever they are working in pomodoro sprints the lamp is on yellow so you know you can't disturb them um uh, um but it's the same thing with meetings if you if you agree to only schedule meetings between 12 and 3 o'clock in the afternoon then your time will will free itself up to do some productive work and you will get much more happier so last last bit i want to explore um and quickly want to look at is that high performance teams develop success habits and the reason why behavioral change is so possible uh, is so uh, difficult and why we need to um, uh, build habits is that um uh, our personality is deeply connected to what we repeatedly do there's this great definition that said you are what you repeatedly do our personality is nothing more than the emerging sum of all of our uh, habits that we have and so changing those habits is incredibly difficult because once someone wants you to do something radically different we kind of experience this as an assault to our uh, identity we don't want to do things because you want me to do things well i feel offended by it that's that's kind of the whole psychological mechanism so um when you apply this um uh, this thinking about habits um if you want to change behavior uh, without people v- feeling too much offended uh, uh by your attempts to change their behavior one of the best ways to do is to to think about designing habits because um because culture emerges from habits and again a, a culture in an organization is nothing more than the sum of its habits that it promotes that it promotes and it and it it suppresses so you should ask yourself the question do we have habit do we have a habit to address problems because if you don't then the first time someone will address a problem will be met with hostility do we have a habit to celebrate success because if you don't then people will feel very you know numb because there's never something to celebrate do we have a habit for giving constructive feedback this is actually the a very very important one because if you don't have a habit of giving constructive feedback then you are constantly raising the bar for giving feedback in a company where um giving feedback is as natural as drinking water then um people don't feel offended at all by, uh, by feedback in 
in organizations where it's very difficult to give feedback, these organizations quite often make terrible mistakes because no one dares to say that something is going terribly wrong. And there's massive, there's examples of massive fuck ups by companies where a lot of people already knew that things were going terribly wrong, but that higher management simply uh, wasn't open to feedback. Read the book, Midnight in Chernobyl. Uh, it's a beautifully written story. And the HBO series on Chernobyl was based on that book. And it was a, a brilliant example of a system that simply wasn't open to feedback because uh, hierarchy after hierarchy uh, didn't want to bring a bad message to the next boss and the next level. That's why the, the eventually um, the whole communist system collapsed because nobody uh, uh, was motivated to hear bad information. And so whole companies were building, uh, for instance, dreadful bad material because the, the, the boss higher in the ranking only wanted to see that quota numbers were being met, that the quality of the things that they were creating completely sucked was completely irrelevant. Um, so the question would be, how can we build those team habits? And I would argue it's incredibly uh, 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 simple. It's just something that you need start that you need to start doing. And I want to give a couple of examples to bring that idea to life. And I think that every team, it shouldn't necessarily be the manager. It should always be someone in a team who wants to become the habit facilitator, who finds it nice to be that person who gets the team to stick to that habit. So a couple of examples. Most of you are familiar with the stand-up. Well, it's a daily habit to just check in to see who needs help. Um, the checkout is a habit that we have after every meeting. We do a checkout. And so the question we ask ourselves after every meeting is, uh, um, what, what do we th thought was really, what went really well in that meeting? And can we give a couple of suggestions for things we could do better the next time? By asking the question in this particular way, give me a couple of things that I could have done better so that I can learn from next time. What I'm really doing is I'm inviting the world, the, 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 the other people to give me constructive feedback because it's positive. It's something that I can do to get better in the next meeting. The killer behavior, the killer habit that we once created at Sue was the retrospective. I have never seen a culture transform so radically than through this simple intervention. And what is a retrospective? Every team um, uh, did this. And um, every two weeks, the, te the team came together to discuss the last couple of weeks. And what they simply did is they asked themselves four questions. Uh, so everyone had to answer these questions. What do I think I did very well in the last two weeks? What am I proud of? Um, what do I think I could have done better? And then what, I, what do I think that you did great uh, in the last couple of weeks? And what do I think that you could have done better or you should do better? Now, I had at, at certain moment in the company, we had two um, uh, different teams. The one team was doing this. The other team was not doing this. Well, the second team was completely imploding. Everyone was unhappy. People felt completely disrespected by the team leader who, who felt that they were not performing well and everyone was crying and there was a lot of, a lot of negative emotion. Um, uh, two of them actually went into burnout. The other team was completely thriving. Well, not after the first week. In the first week, everyone was crying because for the first time, people were actually getting the feedback that they, um, that they never got and it was quite painful. But then after the second and the third week, everyone was getting thrilled because everyone started to realize that this was a completely safe space for them to learn to get feedback and to get to, get to learn what other people thought of their behavior. And there was a very simple rule when someone said, you did this and this made me feel this. The, the way for you to respond to this was to shut up. Um, to just say, thank you for this feedback, I will write this down. Because our natural reflex, of course, is to say, yeah, but I didn't mean it that way. And so the facilitator said, that's not important. This is how you came across to this other person. So shut your mouth and say, thank you for the feedback and do something with it. And after a couple of weeks, what I noticed was that this team become, became obsessed with feedback. 
And uh, it was so fun to see that even in meetings with clients, they were relentless on giving direct feedback. And so to outsiders, it was like, oh, shit, mommy and daddy are having a fight. But it wasn't like that at all. They were, everyone was going, oh, cool, thank you. I didn't realize that. And they were writing it down. It was, it was absolutely awesome. So I hope you can see that um, um, this whole idea of designing uh, 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 um, an exceptional culture is about catering to people's needs and building habits. And habits can be very small. Habits can be a feedback habit at the end of the meeting. Habits can turn into something spectacular like the, the retrospective habit. But as with everything, you need someone who gets you to stick to the habit. Like um, in, in, in that team, uh, there was one person and he was not the manager of the team, but he had the authority by the team to be the facilitator of the habit. And so he got them to stick to the habit. Just like my personal trainer, she was, um, when, whenever she rang my doorbell, we, my wife and I knew that, that we were yeah, basically screwed. Uh, and then she was the boss and we had to go through it no matter which kind of lame excuses we had. And so um, we, we have turned, at Sue, we have turned this working in habits to, to an art form. Like we work in behavioral design sprints and a behavioral design sprint is like this highly uh, structured habitual process in which we in which the same people in a in um, uh, go through this process of insight ideation prototyping testing now the reason why building this highly ritualized highly uh, uh, pro a structured process why it's so awesome well it's for a couple of reasons uh, it, it eliminates eliminates negative group uh, dynamics in a very profound way. First of all, a switching cost. If you do first your research and then you create a report and then you have strategy people doing the strategy and then they will create a report and then the creative people will execute the strategy and then they will create output. Quite often, um, the link between the insights in the beginning and the output in the end is has completely you know uh, degraded completely uh, watered down. Um, whereas if you, if you do a process in which the same people uh, in, a very, in a successive uh, flow go through the whole process, you basically force yourself to always go back to the inside, to always go back to the strategy, to always learn in your prototyping whether your strategy was right or which part of your strategy was actually the most important one. The second thing is it also eliminates expert bias because very often in, in when you are working as a professional, we are um, we are we ourselves have a lot of expert bias because because we are professionals, we are expected to know things. And so we bullshit uh, all kinds of answers to problems that we really have no idea of uh, or we project things we learned in the past to new situations that are very bad proje projections. Or we have hippos in the organizations, which are the highest paid persons in the organizations who, um, who's, who at the end of every creative process pipe up and say, yeah, that's all interesting what you said, but I think we should do it like this. And so we then all do it like this because the hippo uh, has said it. And what happens when you go through this process of doing a sprint and you do prototyping and testing, even if the hippo comes with a, a typical hippo intervention, you always go, that's fascinating, great idea. Let's prototype and test it. It's one of the options we can explore. Thank you for your, uh, your amazing, uh, uh, amazing creativity. And then quite often these ideas bomb and prototype testing, or sometimes they actually work and they say, hey, you were onto something, you had a great hunch because we prototyped it. And look, this is what your customers actually told us. Um, and so, Designing a process that prevents you from all these negative group dynamics, I think, is a very, very powerful way of thinking about how can we get the most out of groups uh, by building a habit. So you can download this high performance team uh, behavior paper um, uh, uh, on the on the website. Um, and this is uh, my last slide. There's still room left for a couple of questions and answers. Uh, oh, hi, Martin Bos. Nice to see you again. Interesting to see that we started explaining that we needed to get rid of old policies only to end up with new policies. <laughs> what do you think of the no rules rules by Aaron Meyer? Uh, to be honest, Martin, I, uh, I only started to reading it, uh, reading it, but I, 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 the first part and I already loved it. The no rules rules. Um, I think that 
um, the, it's it's by the people at uh, LinkedIn. Uh, it's basically the book that was based on this culture deck that was very popular on SlideShare by LinkedIn. Uh, one of the key ideas is that um, uh, you there are you should uh, that talented people hate rules, um, and I uh, and that talented people only want to work with talented people. And if you tolerate non-talented people in your team, then it's like with an apple. If you have a rotten spot in your apple, then it will quickly contaminate the whole apple. So great people get even more, get even better, and get very energized by working with great people. I would say um, uh, the difference between the rules of management systems versus the rules of uh, you know, self-directed teams is, is a massive difference. I, I do think that there are a couple of rules uh, necessary, but these rules have much more to do with, uh, like for instance, uh, do, do we work in design sprints? Do we work with Scrum? Do we work in behavioral design sprints? Do we have certain habits that we um, uh, create with each other in order to get better, like these feedback habits, the retrospective habits. These are necessary rules, but it's like with, with everything in life, you can micromanage it with, uh, with, with rules that become bureaucratic and uh, talented people and talent organization really suffocate from these rules. But on the other hand, if there are completely no rules in place, no boundaries, then it doesn't work neither. So in a system of freedom really needs some strong rules that, that define uh, the playing field. It's like with football. Football is a beautiful game. And this is a beautiful game because there are a couple of simple rules of what's inside the game and what's not. That, that's what makes it work. Uh, I'm a big supporter of self-directing teams. I'm a big supporter of Rockefeller habits as a again, as a behavioral system to, uh, and Martin, you are, um, I think you're an avid user of uh, Rockefeller Habits yourself. Um, um, these are like a playground system for people to uh, get maximum freedom uh, while playing, a court to, uh, playing according to a couple of rules. Th that was a big rant with 10 answers to one question. My apologies to that. Um, uh, Jacques Swanenberg asked the question, does working alone at at home instead of together at the office influence the happiness and performance of a team? Great question. Yes and no. Um, um, the, there's a lot of companies that uh, promoted this, working in distributed teams and that came back from it. Um, I think we should find a new middle ground. Even the companies that are uh, radically distributed, that don't even have a central office, uh, like this, this uh, uh, GitHub company, or uh, not GitHub, some, some uh, company like that. I think they have 1,500 people and they don't have a central office, but they do come together uh, once every two months for at least a week because it turns out that you really need that intimate connection. Uh, so um, again, uh, it's as long as these psychological needs are being met, um, uh, this need for recognition, this need for belonging, this need for appreciation, this need of collaborating with each other to crack uh, complex puzzles. As long as these needs are being met, then people uh, definitely can thrive working abroad. But we still need these moments of intimacy. And we need these indirect moments, because if we have learned to, uh, you know, to, to understand and to read people, we can develop the kind of trust that we need in order to you know, to, to work together and together in a much more trustworthy way. And we humans are, are animals who, that need our, our system one brain, our intuitive brain, to meet someone as monkeys. We need to sniff on them, if you will, in order to be able to trust them. And once we know them and trust them, it becomes so much more easy to, um, to, work, um, to work in a distributed way. So we're about to run out of time. I'm very grateful for you to be in this um, in this webinar. Um, uh, there's actually qu quite some of you. So if you're still interested in uh, in behavioral design, uh, attend one of our master classes. Um, uh, we uh, uh, we're uh, we're still organizing behavioral design fundamental course this summer. There's actually one uh, today going on with 16 people, a uh, full group. Um, uh, we have some. Uh, vacancies in in uh, in uh, later this year, both Dutch and international uh, and English editions. So uh, wherever you are and you are international, feel free to do the behavioral design fundamental course. 
Um, you can also hire us for behavioral design sprints. Do get in touch if you feel that we can, you know, if you can use behavioral design expertise to improve your marketing, uh, uh, shape your culture, or, um, or uh, improve your product uh, or your offering. Um, I hope you enjoy it. The video will be available later on. Um, subscribe to the newsletter, uh, visit the blog, and um, I definitely would, uh, would urge you to get excited, uh, as you can see, uh, that as I am, get excited with how the signs of influence can really, you know, is, is like this, this incredible superpower uh, to, to improve life, to improve work, to improve uh, products. Uh, heck, you can improve, you can use it to improve your own relationship. You can improve it to your own personal well-being. I hope you enjoyed it. Have a great day.